Welcome everybody to the new Fly Fisher. I'm your host, Colin McEwen. On today's show, I'm really excited because I'm going to be floating down the Snake River, the south fork of the Snake River, going through the canyons here. It's beautiful. We're going to be fishing for rainbow trout. We're going to be fishing for cutthroat, brown trout. We're going to be talking about surface, subsurface tactics. I'm with three really experienced anglers. It's going to be a great show. I know you're going to love it. Stay with us. Today I'm doing a drift boat trip down the south fork of the Snake River, which is located in southeastern Idaho, not far from Idaho Falls. The Palisades Dam creates the lower half of the south fork of the Snake River. This river is known for being an outstanding tailwater fishery for cutthroat, brown, and rainbow trout. In fact, it is estimated there's over 3,000 trout per mile river in this section we're fishing. I was privileged to spend the day with several excellent fly fishers. Chad Householder works for Loon Outdoors and is a fanatical fly fisher. He had come to the region for the Federation of Fly Fishers Conclave in Idaho Falls. John Nolan, who is a well-known and respected local real estate agent, has volunteered to row our boat. John is very familiar with this river and loves every inch of it. In our chase boat is Eric White from Hyde Outfitters. Eric is a very confident and popular guide who knows a lot about the Snake River and this region. Probably my favorite type of drift boat fishing is casting big dry flies to rising trout, specifically bouncing large hopper patterns against the bank for trout. This is probably one of the best ways to enjoy a day on a beautiful river. The excitement of a trout slashing at your fly is hard to adequately describe and is something I recommend everyone tries at least once in their lives. A little closer to the bank if you can on that collar. Okay. There, that's what we're looking for. Perfect. Now, is this kind of like chumming in a certain degree we want to keep banging it here? Yeah. Like that? Yep. Ooh. Yeah, just like you're doing. Feel free to pick up and slap it back down. And with this stuff, it's not going to hurt to slap it down hard. because these... You want to get their attention, right? Yeah, when these bugs are falling, they fall hard. One of the keys to success when using these large hopper patterns in relatively fast water is to smack them down during your cast. This gets the trout's attention and they're looking for a big terrestrial to make a bit of a splash when they land near the shoreline. There you go, there you go. Oh, nice. What a jumper. That's a... How was that for a slow take? <laughs> Just kind of leisurely came up and grabbed it? Hey, that's that fly Whitey said wouldn't work. <laughs> no, I see trouble going through this way. Oh, man. Oh. Catch and release. Good trip. Now, John, why are the uh, why are the fish in tight to the banks? Has that got to do with ambush points and looking for terrestrials and things like that? Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, they can hide real well, as you've noticed by the uh, golden eagle and the bald eagles that we've seen so far. A lot of overhead predators. So one, it's a good hiding place, and two, uh, yeah, they can they can just sneak up from out of there, attack, and then you've got a lot of the, uh, especially this time of year, the grasshoppers falling right off the bank. And so it's an easy shot for them. Like most wild animals, it's got what they look for. It's got uh, food and cover. Trout in a big river like the Snake like to use structure to hide from the strong currents. And yet they need to be near the feeding lanes in order to capture the multitude of invertebrates and other aquatic insects which are drifting in the current. The structure we look for, typical of a river like this in North America, is 
Undercut banks created by high water runoff are classic trout areas. Snags, logs, and fallen trees create ideal cover and ambush points for big trout. The natural current break they provide allows fish to minimize energy expended and yet remain close to the feeding lane. Gravel bars provide current breaks and also access to food, especially if they're close to riffles. Of course, boulders and rocks provide excellent seams and cover for trout near the shoreline. They should all be worked over with your hopper pattern. Overhanging bushes, which help hide trout from predators such as raptors, is one of the best places to find large brown trout as well as cutthroat. Of course, when you're casting tight to structures such as this, there is invariably a price to be paid. You're going to get a lot of hang-ups and snags, so bring strong tippet and lots of flies because you're going to need it. That's where they should be. Oh, I missed him. Did ya? Yeah, right there. Put one right there, Chad. Right where? Right, right there. Right in on the side of the log. He's right in against tight. Let, oh. Not that tight. I guarantee that's a cutthroat by that take. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful fish. I'm gonna take and he was right where he's supposed to be, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. And that's your, like I said, you've kind of dialed into where they're, where they're laying. So what I'm going to do, this isn't a real big fish. I'm going to bring this guy. I don't think we need to stop or anything. I'm just going to bring him up. You want a net? Um, yeah, I don't want to hurt him. Barbara, that's out. I'm just going to wet my hands. Beautiful job. All right. Well done. Very nice. Thanks, guys. Nice fish. The thing that's really nice in uh, landing, releasing, and handling the fish is using one of the rubber basket nets here that has become uh, probably the standard for most guides that you'll see out on the rivers now and most recreational fishermen. This rubber basket, when it gets wet, is real slippery and it doesn't take the slime off the fish like some of the cotton nets or the nylon nets would do. So it makes for a much easier time on the fish itself. The hooks don't get snagged up in it. And uh, it, it's just a really good thing to do as far as land and fish goes, this, just taking care of the resource. Okay, the Snake River is classic. Uh, Western River, a lot, of, a lot of water. Right now, it's about 9,000 CFS, but in the spring, when the snow melt's coming out of the Tetons, it can be up to 30,000. It's even been up to about 60,000 CFS. Perfectly made for drifting, cover a lot of water. The section we're doing today is the canyon, canyon section. It's about, I'd say about 10 miles of river. So there's plenty of drifting, a lot of banks to hit, and a lot of riffles, as you see behind me, can stop and fish the ripples to this beautiful river. Before somebody comes out here to uh, take a guided trip on the South Fork, it would be very advantageous to just do a little practicing, maybe on the lawn, out in a soccer field or something. Practice casting your dry flies, okay? And it's going to help you a lot. Maybe read a little bit, rent a video, learn how to do the double haul. You get a lot of wind out here, it can be a windy day. If you know the double haul, you can get that fly into the bank or into the ripple. It's going to help you out a lot. That's probably the most important thing I could think of, just so that when you get here, you're already a step ahead. A lot of folks come out, they've hardly even casted. So half the day is spent just purely instructing the casting, and the fishing isn't that good. 
if you, if you do that, if you practice a little bit before you get out here, you're going to have a lot better day. For sure. It says, you okay there, Chip? I'm all tangled up on something. Okay. Just, just strip him in and I'll get the net. I've got to avoid this tree. Now, is there, do you want me to continue fishing or is this one of those that should get it in? Oh, fish. Keep fishing. Okay. Chad, you give this me the holler when you're ready for me. It's a gorgeous cutthroat. Yeah. Gorgeous. You ready to talk to me about nice. it? Nice. Well, I'm pretty close. You want to get the net out? I've got the net out. Can you yeah. lift his head? Yep. That's nice fish. Beautiful. Can you take the net from me, Chad? i got to grab the sticks with this around it. Hang on for just a sec. Just keep him in the water. It's free. Do you want to swing the handle around to me? Oh, that's a beautiful fish. Okay, we got that. Well done, Chad. Oh, he's gonna go. Nice cutty. Beautiful cutthroat. There you go. Yeah. How about that? Good way to start, guys. There you go. Very nice. You the man. There's a towel right there if you want to wipe the slime away. Yeah, just like you said, he, he uh, slow and easy. <laughs> saw the fly fish, kind of fun. Whoop. Saw him take it, wet, and set. They're usually not in a real big hurry. Wow. I suppose with rainbows that just scream at it, eh? Yeah. How rude to catch one before the host. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> You're out. As far as the insect life here on the South Fork, uh, the most prolific bug is the stone fly. And there's a lot of different kinds. You've got the salmon fly, golden stone, little green stones, and yellow sallies. Now, the salmon fly's life cycle is two to three years. Okay, it takes them two or three years to mature before they hatch. So those bugs are always in this river. You can always catch a fish on a stonefly, whether it be in the nymphal stage or the dry. Okay, so the salmon flies hatch first, then come the goldens, little green stones, and then the yellow, the yellow sallies. So it's really, that's where the fish gets most of its food, is from the stoneflies. Um, second in line would probably be PMDs, little teeny mayflies. Um, they hatch right in these riffles here. That's probably the stoneflies, PMDs, are probably the most most used bug out here. Um, there's also caddis in the bushes. There are, what else have we got? Um, blueing olives, mahoganies, uh, little calabatus, midges. So there's a, lot, there's a lot of food for these fish. There's also aquatic snails. Um, and farther up the river, you get scuds coming out of the dam. But if you really want to narrow it down, these fish really bulk up on stone flies. He's laying on his back, too. Ah, oh, calling the fly. Ah, oh, nice, nice, nice fish. Nice fish. I'm going to pull us into this bay up here. Can you work him around behind yep. the boat? Okay, get him away from this bush. Oh, oh. Get him out in the current here. Get him away from this bush. All righty. Okay. Did exactly what they've been doing all day. Real gentle. Oh, he's getting into the, into the bush. You got the uh, net. He's right. I got him right here now. Okay. Get him away from the bush. He came off him. Just leisurely went. <laughs> gulped it. Nice a brown. Oh, it's a brown. All right. Okay, I'll just get the fly out. There we go. Oh, nice brown, as you said, John. Yeah, pretty aggressive take, huh? Isn't that pretty? Yeah, they're ready to go. There he goes. Outstanding. He didn't, well, he, he took it, but he didn't, t he kind of leisurely came up and smacked it. Uh, like the cutthroat. He didn't do like the other ones we've seen that come up and splash at it. Huh. That's why I thought it was a cutthroat. That's Just unusual the take. for a brown, that's for sure. Yeah, they use a hammer thing, don't they? Yeah, they use Great. a take. He was in that, you know, tucked in under that bank like that, too, just where he could, you know, kind of pick and choose. So. Okay, let's we'll see when we get some more here. Oh, I goodness. like the sound of that. Beautiful brown trout. And look at the topography here. I mean, that is just 
That just takes your breath away. It's so yeah. beautiful. Backdrop makes it uh, a little, even a little more special. The easiest way to explain it is uh, look around. It's just as pretty as anything I've ever been on. And to have a resource like this out here, you've got 3,000 fish per mile, roughly, in this river, so it's very, very good. 60 miles of river to fish and float, and it's all different. Each section of the river has so many different characteristics, from the riffles to the cut banks, uh, to the little back channels that you can fish, to the islands. It's just fantastic. And that's, you know, it's what I love to do. As long as I'm on the water, I'm happy. Oh my goodness, what a beautiful sight. Isn't this fun? Oh. This is uh, something everybody should see in their life. The types of fish you can expect to catch on the snake are, the most prolific are cutthroats, Yellowstone cutthroats. Um, next in line I would say would be rainbows. Cutbows, which are a hybrid between rainbows and the cutthroats. And then brown trout. And the different fish are in different sections. Higher on the river, in the colder water, are the rainbows. And the cut cutthroats are all throughout. Rainbows are higher up, and as you get farther down, you'll we'll catch more browns. But uh, right now, at this stage, the uh, cutthroats outnumber any other fish. And there also are whitefish, suckers, and there are sculpins, little sculpins that wall, wall around the shore. Okay. Out. I've got the fly. Nice fish. There, Chad. Chad Real. Step back. Balance falling out. Thank you. Go. Good looking fish. Yeah. That'll work. Hello, buddy. Well done, Chad. Thank you very much. Well, what's that fly? Uh, super X. Super X. Super, super X. X. Seems That's to be quite little, super. The ugliest streamer I've ever seen. <laughs> it works. Yeah, there it is. He's trying for steelhead. For steelhead, too? Yeah. And well, we're going to put that in the website. Good job. Let's get another one. All right, let's get at it. Well, one of the parts uh, that I do to take care of the fish around here is taking the barb off the flies so that uh, it makes it a lot easier to release the fish, uh, makes it a lot easier to pull out of the back of my head when I hook myself. And all you have to do is take a pair of forceps, nothing too fancy, and just give it a good tight crimp down, put the barb down against the shank of the hook, and uh, it'll keep it from hooking the net, hooking your friends, and hooking yourself. Well, as far as the leader length goes, too, most of the time, you know, around a nine-foot leader is nice. Um, fish in the, you know, fish in the big dries like this, you can go down to six or seven feet and not worry about it too much because we're moving fast enough that, uh, you know, they're not looking at the leader. They're looking at a big bug coming down that they want to chow on. And... Uh, so I don't think you need to worry too much. I actually fish 1 and 2x a lot of times on this river when I'm fishing the big bugs. And with the water colored up a little, they're not too spooky. Oh, come on. So, plus, for all the casting in the bushes we do, it's nice to be able to get a fly back down there. That's always true. <laughs> We've lost a lot of them. <laughs> oh, well, if, that's how you're supposed to do it. So You're not losing flies. You're not fishing well enough. Yeah, you know, you're not in the right spot, that's for sure. Yeah, that was a shadow. So that's great. But nymphing, um, you know, I like to run actually about a 12-foot leader then and make sure that I'm getting down and getting down hard on what's, the... Uh, what's the depth most spots in this river here? 
Oh, this is a big river. I mean, there's a lot of deep water on this. Um, you know, I, I would only be guessing at that. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of weightable water, when the, especially when it gets a little bit lower. But it, it is a powerful river. You know, this is running 10,000 CFS now. There's a lot of rivers in this country that don't see 10,000 CFS all year. I still think that's amazing, considering where I fish the most. Right in under that bush, Chad. One river runs at 300 CFS at the max, the other at 1,200. Somebody's going to come out here. I'd like to see them bring a nine-foot rod. Um, some folks come out with eight and a half foot. It's just not quite enough. You need a big rod for this river. Nine foot, five weight, six weight. You can get away with that. Some people like the four weights. You can throw little PMDs in the ripples with the four weight. But if you bring a five and a six, you're set. We don't use sinking line. It's all floating line. Uh, a lot of 3x. 4x, 5x, 9 foot leaders. Don't need a real long leader. Um, so yeah, I'd stay with, with the floating line, 9 foot, 5 weight, and 6 weight. Right, for me, it's all about the action of trying to pick a fly that's going to mimic most what a fish is eating that day. And it's the whole take of the fly by the fish, that satisfaction that you get by matching it. Generally when I'm out fishing, where I fish the most, I'm on a nine foot five weight rod. That generally is able to get me where I want to go. With that, uh, today specifically we're looking at weight forward, floating line, a 3x liter and on that we're using a uh, foam bodied hopper pattern which has been quite successful in bringing up a few fish today. Right in on the rock. Get him by. You got a um, oh. too much slack here. Hey, look at that look at that dragonfly. See it on the water there? Is that what's happening to solid? You got it, John. Go ahead. What a great day. We got a lot of fish. We had a lot of fun. If you get a chance, you want to fish here on the Snake River. It's phenomenal. It's one of the great things they have here in Idaho. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you want to learn more about the patterns we used today, go to our website at www.thenewflyfisher.com. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Hi, I'm Tom Rosenbauer. For videos like the one you just saw and more, subscribe to our channel. You don't want to miss our weekly uploads of educational videos, exciting trips, and much more.